God drops heaven's assignments into our hearts. Some of these may be small and some may be big life assignments. We draw insights from Nehemiah's pursuit of rebuilding the walls on what goes into fulfilling a God-given assignment. If you've brought your Bible with you, I just want you to hold it high up in the air. Uh, let's make this declaration loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word, and I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Please turn around, say hi to the people next to you, in front of you, behind you. Say hello, shake hands, give them your name, please, and then you may be seated. Thank you so much. All right, this morning, we're going to do something very, very simple. We're going to spend some time, uh, not a long time, some time in the book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah is a very favorite book to many people. Uh, many of us like it. Uh, you know, there are a lot of leadership messages or teaching that comes out of the book of Nehemiah. There's a lot of revival, restoration messages that come out of the book of Nehemiah and so on and so forth. So, uh, there's a lot, lot of uh, different messages and series of teachings that come out of this book of Nehemiah. And uh, we're going to spend some time here in this book just looking at what is involved in the fulfilling of an assignment. All of us are on assignments. Some of our assignments are short term. You do something and you move on. Some of our assignments are long term. Big assignments. Life assignments. Uh, you commit significant portions of your life to seeing that accomplished. And so in the book of Nehemiah, we have both. We have Nehemiah being sent on a short assignment. A 52-day assignment. That's really short. He works on rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem. That covers the first six into the early part of chapter 7. Those 52 days. But then he moves from there into the uh, we could call it a bigger assignment or a life assignment, which is the spiritual restoration and revival of the Jewish people inside Jerusalem, which takes him 12 to 20 years later on. But what we're going to do this morning is just look at the first assignment, just that short assignment, and draw very simple lessons on what it takes to fulfill a God-given assignment. God is in the habit of putting assignments into our hearts. In fact, He wants each one of us to be on some assignment that's from Him. Something we're doing that He's put in our hearts. And uh, God does that. He has assignments for your life and mine. And He puts those assignments into our lives. And He says, okay, and I want, to, I want you to journey into seeing that assignment fulfilled. And so we're just going to draw some simple lessons on what it takes to fulfill an assignment that God gives to us, whether it's a short term, a life assignment, or, and so on. But let's just give a little brief background to the book of Nehemiah, uh, just to set the context. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian emperor or king, invaded Jerusalem or Jerusalem around 605 BC. That was the first time he invaded Jerusalem, ransacked the city. And then they were between 605 to 5, 
80 BC, around that time, a 20-year period or so, he uh, came basically on three invasions, repeated invasions into Jerusalem. At the end of it, the temple and the city was really destroyed, and the people were deported, sent into exile into Babylon. Most, and these dates are approximate, but most people would say that around 586 BC was the year that he came and he destroyed uh, the temple. And then followed the 70 year exile of the people into Babylon. The Babylonian Empire was overthrown by the Medes. The Medes were overthrown by the Persians. The Persian Empire came into existence in a power. And King Cyrus, the Persian Empire, around 536 BC, issues a decree saying, Go back, rebuild the temple. So Zerubbabel takes the leadership at that time and he comes back to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So those were the books Zechariah, Haggai were written around that time. Some of you are familiar with that. So after the rebuilding of the temple, and it's also the first part of the book of Ezra that records the rebuilding of the temple, we then have the story of Esther. Many of us are familiar with the story of Esther that takes place at that time. And then, subsequent to that, Ezra, the scribe, moves into Jerusalem to start working on getting the people back into their spiritual heritage. Get, get them back to seeking God and so on. So Ezra moves back to Jerusalem to work on that. And then, right after Ezra comes in, comes Nehemiah, around 545 B.C is when this story of Nehemiah coming back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of the city takes place. So you all with me so far? Just a little historical setting. So that's the book of Nehemiah. So at that time, around 545 BC, Nehemiah is actually working for the Persian king. He's a cupbearer, actually a high official for the Persian king at that time. Very important role. And uh, like many other Jewish people who are, in ex who are in exile, he hears news that the walls of the city of Jerusalem have still remained the way they were when Nebuchadnezzar came and they were broken down in ruins. Something happens to him. There were a lot of other people who heard the same news and they said, oh yeah, someday, sometime, those walls will come back. We're happy here. But for Nehemiah, it disturbed him, made him feel rest restless. Walls of the city, they've got to get back. They've got to be rebuilt. And so, you know, he begins to pray. He is so disturbed, he cries about it. He weeps over it. And soon the king notices something different. Nehemiah, you know the same smiley guy that you were before, what's happened to you? And then Nehemiah tells the king, king, you know, I'm really disturbed about the walls of my city, Jerusalem. Uh, the walls have been broken down and there's nobody doing anything about it. I want to go. I want to see those walls rebuilt. And immediately, the favor of God comes upon Nehemiah's life. The king gives him a leave of absence. You're welcome to go. And not only that, I'll make sure that I give you proper authorization. I, I'm going to give you a letter that, uh, that says you've been authorized by me to go do this. And not only that, I will send you an escort of people to take you there. And not only that, I will make sure that you get all the materials you need to get the job done. That's huge. So that's how... The chapter 1 begins that it all starts with a stirring in Nehemiah's heart. So the first lesson from chapter 1. What's stirring inside you? What disturbs you? What makes you restless? It may not be the same thing that disturbs somebody else. But that stirring in your heart, pay attention to it. Start praying about it. Recognize it. Respond to it. Talk to God about it. 
What's moving inside you? And you will begin to see these things come into alignment. Open doors, divine favor, supernatural provision. That's God patting you on the shoulder and saying, you're on my assignment. So when there's a stirring in your heart, when you see God setting up an open door for you, releasing divine favor, causing divine provision to come in, and you see these factors just align themselves, you are on assignment. You can't afford to ignore that. Are you with me? God has assignments for each of us. And He sets them up for us. It starts with what He does inside our hearts. But you can see His hand at work in your circumstances, in your situations. God is setting you up. But you've got to respond. So that's what Nehemiah did. He made this journey from Sushan or Susa, which was the capital of the Persian Empire. Uh, on the other side, on the east side of the river Tigris, and he moved, makes his way all the way to Jerusalem. He comes in, and, and uh, the next thing we, we see here is incubation time. Now, before we finish the service this morning, we're going to take some time to pray for people uh, on that first point. So we'll come back to that. But the second thing we see here, uh, as Nehemiah progresses into his assignment, is that he spends time incubating that. He doesn't just rush off and start rebuilding those city walls, but he takes time to do a survey. So he gets to the city, spends three days in the city, familiarizes himself with what's going on there, and at night, I mean, he doesn't want anyone to know about his assignment yet. At night, he goes and surveys the city walls. Takes stock of things. I'm sure plans are running through his mind and, 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 and he's, things are coming together inside him. So that incubation time is also very important for you and me. That as you find a stirring in your heart and you're recognizing God setting you up for an assignment that he has for you here, on earth, whether it's a short-term thing, or whether it's a life assignment, whatever God's setting you up for, as you recognize it, it's also important to give yourself this incubation time. Time where you do your survey, you're studying, you're preparing, you're, 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 you're getting yourself ready on the inside for this assignment. It's also around this time as he's incubating this whole thing, that he comes to a personal conviction that what's stirring inside him is really God's assignment for his life. You find that in chapter 2 and verse 12. He says, you know, I rose in the night and a few men with me. I told no one what God, put, what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. So now he's coming to that place. You know what? This is something God has put in my heart. It's not just my own stirring. It's God putting it into me. And I believe that you and I must come to that place of personal conviction that the assignment you're stepping on is something God put in your heart. If you're not in that place and you step out, then when you face difficulty, then when you face challenges, the tendency is to back off. But when that conviction is there inside you, that this is what God has put in my heart, then you're going to stick with it. So that incubation time is very important. Amen? So take that time, however long it may be. We're just looking at uh, what happened in Nehemiah's life, but for some of our lives it may be a little longer. May even take a few years for you to incubate something that God is stirring you up, and that's fine. You need to come to a place where you know it's time to move forward. And that's what he does. And uh, the third thing that we see Nehemiah do, this is in chapter 2, I'm looking at verses 16 to 20. 
is that Nehemiah then communicates the vision. He shares the vision. He gets the Jewish people together and he says, guys, I want to tell you that the city walls need to be rebuilt. And then he shares with them what God has done, the good hand of the Lord upon his life. How God opened the door for him. How God gave him favor. How God has released provision. And that vision now grips the hearts of the people. And they say, we are in. We are in. So it's no longer just Nehemiah's assignment or Nehemiah's vision. Now it's, it becomes a collective thing. It's amazing to see what, how the people respond in verse 17 of chapter 2. They say, come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem. Then it's an Emma. It's great. You've got a vision. God bless you. We'll pray for you. Go. They said, let us. Let us build. We are in it. Let us do this together. Let us work on this together. And Nehemiah does something amazing as he communicates the vision. He does not draw people to himself. So the vision is not centered around the man. He draws people to God, the God who opened the door, the God who gave him favor, the God who gave the provision, the God whose good hand was upon him. So all eyes are on the Lord. Not on Nehemiah. How do we know that? When you look at verse 20, what do the people say? The people say in verse 20 of chapter 2, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore we, his servants, will arise and build. Everyone's eyes are on the Lord. Not on Nehemiah. And that's so important, how we communicate the vision. When we share the vision with people, let it not be centered around us. It's about God. Because ultimately, we are all going to draw our strength from Him. The God of heaven will prosper. So we're going to do this work. So He communicates the vision. He shares the vision. And the fourth thing we see, and this is the entire chapter 3, is that He enlists participation. In chapter 3, just a narrative of all groups of people stepping in. You have all kinds of workmen. You have the priests. You have nobles. You have officials. All kinds. Men and women. Everybody get in on this. And at that time, Jerusalem had about 11 gates for the city. Entry points in and out. Gates around the city. And there were four towers around the city walls. People could look out to see you know, if any enemies coming. So uh, along these city gates and along these towers, the people posi positioned themselves and started to work. Wherever the walls needed rebuilding, they started to work. Others find their assignments as they participate. In an assignment God's given you. And we must understand that most often a God-given vision is bigger than the individual. It's very rare that somebody can say, I have a vision from God and I can do this all by myself. It's very, very rare. Most often a God-given vision is bigger than the individual. So if you have a great vision, you also have to have a great heart to accommodate many people, to enlist the participation, to welcome the involvement of many people. And, many, and sometimes we find that difficult because it literally means you give up control of that vision. Because now it's no longer yours. It's everybody's doing it together. God may have used you to be a catalyst. God may have used you to receive and release. But that's all you are. Now if others have stepped in. And have positioned themselves. Found their place. And are going to be involved in seeing this work come to pass. It's 
So you've got to enlist participation there. Now, it does say in verse 5 of chapter 3 that some of the nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of the Lord. There will be some people who still aren't convinced that what you're doing is really from God. There will still be some people who are skeptical that something like this can be done. Something like this can actually take place. And they will hold back. They will not participate. And that's okay. Don't let the lack of enthusiasm, the support, the lack of support from some people, the skepticism or the questioning of some people cause you to doubt what God has put in your heart. That's why that incubation period is so important. Because you've come to a place that you know what's in your heart is from God. And even if you find some people who are refusing to participate, unwilling to step in, you're going to go forward. Amen? So now we progress to the next thing we see in chapter 5, which is, not chapter 5, chapter 4 and the fifth point, is that as soon as the work begins, they face external threats. Now, of course, it's as part of the Persian Empire, in addition to the Jewish people, there were other tribes who had been conquered by the Persians and were part of the Persian Empire. And the leaders of those tribes, when they saw that Nehemiah and the Jewish people were rebuilding the walls of the city, they began to mock it. They began to laugh at it. What are you trying to do? You think you can rebuild the walls? Oh, you guys, you build the walls. Even a dog passes through the walls will fall down. They began to mock the work. And they even plan to attack the work. We'll come. We'll stop this. So there are there is external threats. And you and I must understand that just because we have a God-given vision doesn't mean we will not face challenges. In fact, the more the si a sign that you're on God's assignment is that the devil's interested in stopping us and in interfering with it and trying to disturb it, cause some problem. It's a sign. It's a good sign. I'm doing something from God. But the way Nehemiah responds to this challenge, this entire chapter 4 is just beautiful. And I just summarize it in a few words. The first thing he does is he calls people to pray. He says, guys, let's pray. They turn their eyes to God. God, the enemy people are against us. They're challenging us. But we are looking to you. We pray. Then, the next thing he does, he rallies the people and he says, we're going to work as a team. While some of you are doing the work, others are go you're going to stand as guards with your weapons to protect the people who are working. And then you switch. You take turns. Those who were guards when you are working, those who are working will stand guard with their weapons. It's around the clock. They worked as a team. And then he also said, you know, if there is trouble at any part of the wall, they're going to sound an alarm. They're going to blow a trumpet. And wherever you hear the trumpet, all of us are going to gather there. We're all going to come there. That's how we're going to keep this work going. Isn't that a beautiful picture of teamwork? Of being there for each other. Of having that confidence in your heart that if you're in trouble, the rest of the guys are going to come and stand with you. What if we created something like that here? If you didn't realize it, we are on assignment as a church. And we're all in it together. We are called to be salt and light in our city. That means have impact and have influence over the city of Bangalore. To be a voice to our nation. That means we go to various parts of our nation and release what God's given to us. And to the nations. But there will be problems. Threats from outside. 
But that's when we need to stand there for each other. While some are working, others are on guard. Praying. People are praying, are working, others are on guard. Praying. If there's trouble anywhere, we all rally together. It doesn't mean we all physically come in one place, but we extend our support through various ways, through prayer, through encouragement, uh, by just assuring people, look, we're with you. We can do that. And so the work on rebuilding the walls continue. When you come into chapter 5, we see that there are internal conflicts. So what had happened? There were people who were nobles or officials who had a lot of money. But then there were also people who were not so well-to-do. And so they had mortgaged their lands. They had borrowed, taken loans. And now they were struggling financially and materially. They were unable to pay back their loans and they didn't have enough for themselves at that time. And they had to still participate in this work. It was very difficult for them. And they had to face the people from whom they had borrowed. So things were difficult. And that was causing problems inside the city. Among the people themselves who had work. So Nehemiah found out about that. He called all the high-ranking people, the leaders, the officials. And he demands from them sacrifice. He says, guys, I want you to cancel the debts that your brothers who are not well-to-do, whatever they owe, I'm asking you to cancel it. I'm asking you to let it go. So he, he holds the leaders to a high standard. He asks them to sacrifice for the sake of that one cause that everyone is involved in. And interestingly, they all readily agree. Verse 8 of chapter 5, they say, We, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren. And we let them go. And, and they agree to it. And they restore their lands, their vineyards, whatever they have taken, they just give it back to them. They bless their own people. And I find that a lesson for us that when we are on an assignment, there will be internal problems. We've got to address them. We've got to deal with them. But in the process, we are going to hold leaders to a higher standard. And that's biblical. At the book of James, it's not on the screen, but James says, you know, brethren, those of us who are teachers, we're going to receive a stricter judgment. I mean, it's going to be hard for us. God holds us. And lead those of us in leadership to a higher standard. So now Nehemiah resolves that. And not only does he do that, but the next thing we see is he holds himself to that high standard. That's the seventh lesson that we can draw here. He maintains high standards, personal standards. You find this in the latter part of chapter 5, verses 14 through 19. Nehemiah has been appointed by the Persian king to be the governor of the province of Judah. As governor appointed by the Persian king, he has rights to certain luxuries and certain comforts, provisions, all of that. But because he is on assignment, he chooses not to take advantage or make use of those provisions, those luxuries. He says, no, I won't. Read about that in verse 14. He says, for 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. In verse 15, the end of it, he says, I did not do so because of the fear of God. Am I, why aren't you taking it? Something in my heart towards God that says, okay, I don't need to. I don't want to. He sets the example. He holds himself to high standards. And 
he makes his prayer to God. Verse 19 of chapter 5, he says, Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. God, I'm looking to you. My reward comes from you. As I do people good by this sacrifice, but not by not taking what the king has granted to me as a governor, Lord, you do me good. My reward's coming from you. That's a man on assignment. When you are on assignment from God, God's put you on something. There may be times that you will have to make some personal sacrifices. There may be times when you will have to hold yourself up to higher standards. Do it. Look to God for your reward. You don't have to look to the applause of man. Your reward comes from God. And so, as Nehemiah progresses along with the people in the rebuilding of the walls in chapter 6, now he faces personal attacks. So these same guys, Sanballat and Tobiah, their lead, other leaders of the other tribes who are really jealous of the work that's happening. They figure out, hey, we can't stop them from doing the work. Let's get rid of their leader. So they start attacking Nehemiah personally. First, there's a conspiracy. They invite him for lunch. Hey, Nehemiah, you're doing such a great work. Can you come and have lunch with us? We'll be honored if you do. They actually intended to kill him. Nehemiah's response in verse 3 of chapter 6, he sends a reply to them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Sorry, I'm too busy. Schedule's full. Sometimes it's good to be really busy. It keeps you out of trouble. And I say, sorry, I can't come. I'm just really busy. But it actually saves his life. Actually saves his life. Then they raise up false accusations. Oh, Nehemiah is doing this because he's going to announce himself as king. And then he's going to revolt. He's going to rebel against the Persian king. False accusations. Nehemiah says, hey. The king knows my heart. He's the one who authorized me. It's not going to work. So as a leader, as somebody who's been given an assignment from God, as you move out and doing what God's assigned you to do, whether it's a short assignment, life assignment, whatever, there will be times when attacks will get personal, regardless of who it comes from. But you've got to have that strength inside you to stay focused, or what God's called you to do, deflect off these accusations, stay away from traps that have been laid for you, stay busy with your assignment, stay focused, and keep the work going. Even the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, the great Apostle Paul was doing a great work he faced so many accusations personally against him. And he writes about this. I'll just make mention of one in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 10. You know, this is the accusation against Paul from the Corinthians. It says, they, they say, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Meaning, hey, he writes all this heavy, heavy stuff, but when you really meet him, nothing impressive. things people say about him. So he had all these things. Some were questioning his apostleship. Is he really an apostle of Jesus Christ? And all of that. But he kept going. You need to keep going. The assignment God's given to you. So finally, the work is completed. You read about this in chapter 6. 
Verse 15, on the 52nd, 52 days, the wall is finished. And everyone, verse 16 says, they perceived that this work was done by other God. People saw. Everybody. Those who did the work and all the enemies. Wow. This has to be done. The work is done. The walls have come back again. The city is secure. People are safe. The wall has been rebuilt. And then Nehemiah does an amazing thing. This is in chapter 7, verses 1, 2, and 3. He appoints people to continue. Appoints two of the brethren, the Jewish brethren. He says, you are going to be in charge of the city of Jerusalem. He, he chooses them because he thought, verse 2 says, he was a faithful man and feared God more than any. You see, he selected the right people. People were faithful and people feared God. I said, guys, my job is done, but the city still needs leadership. You guys are going to be in charge of this city. Faithful people, people who feared God. And he gave them instructions how to keep the city secure, when to open the gates, when to close the gates, so the people are kept safe. And that's an important thing to learn to know when to hand over the work and move on when your time is up and establish continuity because God wants the work to continue and, and keep people, keep the right people in place. But I see something very interesting. Once Nehemiah does that, then in chapter 7 and verse 5, something happens. Nehemiah receives his next assignment. Very interesting. It says there in verse 5, Then my God put it into my heart. Next thing to do, Nehemiah. Next thing to do. It says, Then God put it into my heart. And so now he transitions to the next phase of his work, which really had, which really brings him into a, a spiritual work. Uh, he, along with Ezra, the scribe, they work on revive, restoring the people and reviving them spiritually, bringing them back uh, to their faith in God, restoring the worship uh, in the temple and, and, and getting people to begin to hear the word of God and obey the word of God. But what I find interesting is this. Both in chapter 2 and verse 12, when he received his first, first assignment, and in chapter 7 and verse 5, when he received his second assignment, it happened the same way. God put it in my heart. God put something in my heart. Meaning something began to stir in me, is what Nehemiah said. For most of us, that's the way God-given assignments are going to come. Some of us may have dreams. We may have angels. You may see the handwriting in the sky. That's probably very few of us. For most of us, the way God puts us on assignment is by dropping something into our heart. Something that stays there. Something that stirs you inside. Something that sometimes even disturbs you. But that's how God sets us up. On a side. And then he aligns. The open door. The favor. The provision. He puts them in your life. That's a clear indicator he wants you on that assignment. I believe God has assignments for each one of us. Maybe small, maybe big. But he's got assignments. Some of us may say, Pastor, that's nice for Nehemiah. For me, I haven't figured it out yet. 
what's the assignment? There's nothing stirring in my heart. Nothing. I'd encourage you to start praying and say, God, put it in my heart. Let something begin to stir in there what you want me to do. For some of us, maybe there is something stirring. We knew God wanted us to do that, but we just ignored it. Got busy with something else. Of course, we all have responsibilities in life and we've got to take care of things. And we've become so preoccupied taking care of things that we've not acted on something God dropped into our hearts. Could be a long time ago, but it's still there in some corner of your heart. Search through all the other things and you'll find that assignment still lingering. God put it into your heart. Still there. Maybe this morning you'd be encouraged just to pray and say, God, is that something you really want me to do? And I'm, I want to get myself ready for that. But this morning I want to also especially pray for people who have recognized the assignment. But you're waiting for the next three to fall in place. You're waiting for the door to open for favor and provision. I want to specially pray for those people. I'm going to call our worship team up. We're going to take a few moments just to pray for people who have a stirring in their heart. It's been there and you recognize it. God's put something in your heart. But what you're waiting for is, God, I want to see that open door. I want to see that favor of my life. For my life. And I want to see that provision coming through. I want to see these things coming in. Line. So I know you are moving me into that. I can begin to act on it. So if you're in that situation, you identify with that. I feel this morning God really wants us to pray for those people. I'm not saying others are not important. I'm just saying for them, you can release a prayer, release miracles so that these things will fall in place. And you can begin with that incubation time at the right time, step out and begin to act on what God has put in your heart. So as our worship team gets ready, we're going to pray together. I'm going to ask us to just pray for those people. If they stand up right next to where you are, then I just want you to go surround them and pray for them. So those of you in this place, there may be a few. Say, you know, I have an assignment in my heart. I know God's put it in there, but I need these three things to line up in my life. If you don't mind, and this is not to embarrass you, this is only to pray for you. If you don't mind, you can stand. Would you stand up where you are, please, so that people around you can pray for you? If you say, I have an assignment in my heart, I know God put it there, but I need these things lined up in my life. I need to see an open door, I need to see favor. I need to see provision. I believe this is your morning. So would you just, if you identify, just stand up, not to embarrass you, just stand up. Then I'm ask, going to ask people around you, a couple of people around you. See these people who are standing, just go to them and pray for them. You don't have to ask them all the details. Just go to them and just begin to pray. So pray for these three things. God, an open door, for favor, for provision. Pray for these three things on their lives. Come. Others, just stand up. Just go to these people who are standing. And just pray for them. Pray for them. Father, we are a body. We are here to encourage one another. We are here to support one another. And we pray for these people who are standing, God.
Father, they recognize a stirring in their heart, something that you want them to do, but they are waiting for three things. And we as a church, as their friends, as their family, we pray in the name of Jesus for open door, for favor, and for divine provision to come into their lives in the name of Jesus. Lord, release your miracle working power. Release your mighty power, Lord, into each of these lives. And let them see, God, a door open. Let them see favor giving them access. Let them see provision so that they can get the job done. Release this, Father, for them. Send angels. Send your ministering spirits to orchestrate, to work in their situations, in their circumstances, to swing the door open, to cause favor upon their lives. And it caused provision to come. Those of you who stood for prayer, I want you to just say, God, I thank you for open door, for favor, for provision. Just thank the Lord right now. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Father, that today will be a day they'll remember that we prayed for this. And God, you moved supernaturally in their lives. Causing these things to fall in place for them. So that they can do what you've put in their hearts to do. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Hey. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.